Prax presents Z170 set up an overclock. Now that I've got my Z170 system set up, I wanted to share some tips, tricks, and best practices for some of the things that I ran into while setting up the BIOS settings, installing Windows, and some of the best practices for ensuring optimal performance in your system. Now you've got XMP RAM, you've got overclocking in mind, you've got a lot of other things that you would like to do in the settings in your BIOS, but hold on just one minute. The first thing you want to do is ask yourself the question, do I want RAID or do I not? This is extremely important if you're considering installing your operating system on a SATA drive. If you install your operating system on a SATA drive and you don't take into consideration RAID or non-RAID, if you ever need to make a change, you may wind up reinstalling Windows. If you're planning on not using RAID, you will see some performance gains on boot time as initializing the RAID controller does take about 5 to 7 seconds during the boot period. My preferred configuration would be to have either a PCIe or an M.2 storage device as your OS drive, and then putting everything in RAID so that I can have storage drives in RAID 1. That protects my data in case any of the drives fail. I recommend that before you install Windows the first time, that you disable all of the other drives in your system other than your OS drive. The reason for this is that sometimes Windows puts the system reserved partition on another drive. What will happen then is if you were to disconnect that drive from your system or there was a hard drive failure, Windows will actually fail to boot and it's a very big pain to reinstall that. By disabling all your other drives before installing Windows, you ensure that the system reserved partition ends up on the correct drive. As soon as Windows is installed, go ahead and insert the CD that came with your motherboard to ensure that you install all the correct drivers, but watch out for included software like Norton Security unless you're planning on using that. Once you have all the drivers installed and everything is operating correctly, proceed to the website for the manufacturer of your motherboard and download the most recent BIOS update. You'll need this to ensure compatibility with your CPU and with your RAM. It may also help with stability when attempting to overclock your system. If you're having difficulty installing Windows, you may have to retrieve the BIOS update from another system prior to trying to install Windows. My initial BIOS version for my Z170 Deluxe motherboard was version 404. All the error 404 jokes aside, my XMP profiles on my memory would not post unless I had the latest update. This tells me that the initial BIOS versions were not capable of handling certain settings when it came to XMP profiles. Now in order to update your BIOS, while you're in the BIOS, you're going to have to go to the Advanced Settings, then you're going to want to go to your Tool menu, and click on the ASUS Easy Flash Utility. Once you have the utility selected, choose where you'd like to update from. You can update from a USB storage device, Select your storage device, select where it is, and then proceed to update your BIOS from the file. Once your BIOS version is up to date, go ahead and boot into your BIOS, and then load your first XMP profile that matches the speed that your RAM is rated for. You should now be able to reboot and see if the system will load into Windows without any problems. If it won't load into Windows, it means that your overclock on your XMP profile may be too high or that your CPU may not be able to manage the memory at that speed. You can either try a separate XMP profile or stick with the stock profiles. If your XMP profile is loaded correctly, you can now take an attempt at overclocking your CPU. This is where I'd like to share some information with you. I have worked with three different Core i7-6700K processors, and in my experience, I've found that the overclocks do range. For example, my stock voltage was 1.318 volts. The stock voltage on the two other chips that I worked with were 1.298 volts and 1.264 volts. I was able to achieve a 4.6 GHz overclock at 1.285 volts, which is actually underclocking the CPU from the factory settings. The other two were over able to overclock to 4.6 at 1.285 volts and 4.5 GHz at 1.31 volts. I found that trying to get to 4.7 volts wasn't very effective. 
the amount of voltage required to make the jump from 4.6 to 4.7 was just too high. I wasn't willing to take that risk. My aim is to get a stable overclock that is within a reasonable voltage range so that we look at longevity for your processor as well as performance. In order to overclock your CPU, you're going to have to go into the advanced mode and go to your AI tweaker and scroll down to where you have your CPU core slash cache voltage. Here you can set your voltage to manual mode and type in the voltage that you'd like. My suggestion would be to start at 1.3 volts and test that with 4.6 gigahertz. In order to overclock your CPU, you're going to want to go to the AI tweaker and scroll down to the CPU core ratio. There you're going to want to set it to sync all cores and you can set the core 1 ratio limit to 46. 46 times your base clock frequency of 100 gives you 4600 megahertz or 4.6 gigahertz. Once you have this setting configured, reboot into Windows and test your overclock either by running RealBench or another benchmarking software of your choice. For myself, I'm using RealBench, which can be downloaded from the ASUS website if you Google ASUS RealBench. The RealBench stress test is quite good at testing to ensure your system is stable. I would recommend starting at 15 minute intervals, and once you're happy with your voltage and your overclock, you can try running up to 1, 2, or 4 hours on the RealBench stress test. While running the stress test, you'll also want to use either the hardware monitor from CPUID, or their CPUID CPU-Z application to ensure that your voltages are where they should be and to watch your temperatures to ensure that they don't get over 60 or 70 degrees. With a good all-in-one water cooler, you should be able to keep the temperatures below, at or around 65 degrees. I personally don't feel comfortable exceeding around 75 degrees as an absolute maximum when running RealBench. Once you've been able to run through a long iteration of RealBench or another benchmarking utility, you can be certain that your overclock is stable and that you won't run into issues down the road. A common question about overclocking is, can I damage my CPU? Well, in reality you can. Too much voltage for too long period of time or too much heat can have an adverse effect on your CPU. This is actually caused by something called electromigration. Electromigration essentially happens when an electron gets bumped from one particle to another. This causes positively charged ions to form. What can happen is when an electron bumps into one of these ions, it can actually cause it to move to a different location. Now, this is happening at a microscopic level, so you can't actually see it. Although I will post a link to another video where you can see electromigration happening in a gold semiconductor. Effectively what happens is the particles get pushed forward and eventually your connection breaks. Electromigration is heavily affected by two different factors, one of them being voltage and one of them being heat. So when you're overclocking, you are increasing the voltage and you are increasing overall heat. So when we talk about electromigration for the Skylake Core i7-6700K CPU, it's a safe bet to assume that the stock voltages 1.3, 1.31, that those voltages are fairly safe for your CPU. When you start getting into 1.4, 1.45, you are accelerating electromigration. Now this may cut six months or one year off of the life of your CPU, and it may cause more. One thing for certain is that CPUs that have a heavy overclock after time tend to need the voltage increased in order to maintain stability. That's because electromigration has caused a lot of these connections to get thinner, requiring more voltage in order to make the jump and pass the electricity on to the next part of the conductor. As a final note, I almost forgot, when installing using the NVMe Intel 750 series PCIe SSD drive, you're going to want to ensure that you go and download the Intel drivers for your NVMe device. Microsoft does have NVMe drivers built into Windows, but when you're using an NVMe Intel device, you want to go straight to the source for drivers, as they will provide you with optimal performance and longevity. Well guys, that's it for my video. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments and I'd be happy to answer them. And if you liked my video, please click like or subscribe. If you have any requests on other videos you'd like to see, please let me know and I'd be happy to make them for you.